There you go, that's the signal. So, isn't it? And action. Yeah, action. Hi, I'm here with ex professional football player and coach Roy Massey. Roy, thank you for your time today. Nice to see you again after all these years. I know, it's been a little while. Going back some years, haven't great, we? great to see you. Now, in your playing career, you played for Rotherham, Leyden Orient, and you finished at Colchester United. Yeah. Can you remember your first football memory? Um, my well, my first football memory goes back to me being ten years of age when uh, I was selected for the uh, primary school that I was going to, yeah. and um, remember running home to tell my mum and dad that I've been selected for the team, and um, something obviously I wanted to do um, in terms of loving playing football. Didn't think about becoming a professional footballer in those days, but. That's my first memory, just the excitement of being selected yeah. for my first game of football. Oh, fantastic. And then from your playing career, you finished your playing career at Colchester United and then you began co your coaching career at Colchester United where you spent 15 mm. years as youth team coach. You then went to Norwich and then I think it was Liam Brady took you to Arsenal in 1999. That's right, yes. So some big clubs there. Ever, ever wish you'd gone to a really big club like West Ham? Well, to be fair, West Ham did approach me when I was working for Norwich City. And, and you chose uh, Arsenal over, and, over West Ham? Uh, um, yes, I... Uh, well, West Ham obviously were a very good side and they had a great reputation for developing youngsters. Uh, but uh, the pull of Arsenal Football Club when Lynn Brady gave me a ring was a bit too much and uh, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't turn Arsenal down. And even as a West Ham fan, I can see that Arsenal may have a bit more lure than, than the mighty Irons. Well, West Ham, as I said, in those days, had a wonderful youth policy and over the years they, didn't, they, they developed didn't, yeah. some fantastic players. Yeah. Who were some of the players that you brought through at Arsenal? I mean, you were there for 15 years? Well, I, I mean, before Arsenal, um, when I, I remember working with Norwich City and um, during one holiday, um, I did sign a young lad called Anthony McFarlane from the London area. I saw him play for... South London schoolboys against um, Colchester and he came up for um, a year or so when he was training during the holidays and then he came to me one day and said Roy um, we were playing Luton the following week he said Roy can my mate come up and play he was 13 years of age I said young mate well, you can't just have anybody coming to play for Norwich City um, is he any good your mate he said well he plays for the district side. I said, what's his name? He said, Rio Ferdinand. <laughs> I said, well, okay, bring him up then. And so he came up to Luton. And um, after the first 10 minutes of the game, he's playing in midfield and Gordon Bennett, who was my boss and myself, we just looked at each other with our mouths wide open to say, wow, here's a young player. And you could tell that that lad was going to be a top, top player. So it was, um, a great experience. I remember him start. coming through West Ham, just thinking. At that time, it was so he was a, a central defender, but with this ability to just move the ball forward like a midfielder. Exactly, and that's where he started as a midfield player. He came to us at Norwich, and he came to us for about a year. And we then, uh, Gordon and myself, went down to his house um, to see if he would sign for um, Norwich when he was fourteen. But he decided to go to West Ham, and rightly so, because he was just down the road from him. Yeah. But we had a really good year um, watching yeah. him play. Wow, I bet. Any other players? I mean, I think it was Jack Wiltshire come through. Well, the other players, um, <clears throat> obviously a number of lads from Arsenal, and um, youngsters do want to sign for Arsenal, so yeah. you've got a better chance of signing players at the very highest level than when you're with Colchester United and no disrespect to Colchester. Uh, but Jack Wilshire came along and uh, when he was nine we bought him um, from Luton. Well we paid compensation for £2,000 for him and uh, when we saw him first play at nine he was unbelievable really the way he could dribble past people and yeah. that's what took my eye and um, he got good balance and he scored goals and the most important thing as well as he is today very very competitive and um, I do remember taking him uh, with my uh, colleague Steve Leonard to um, 
Belgium to play in a tournament and um, he was doing really well in this tournament, 12 years of age. We got to the semi-final, we played in PSV Eindhoven and uh, the guy from uh, Belgium who was looking after us then said, Roy, Jack Wilshire, he'll be playing in the tournament, he's four points ahead of everybody else if he has a good game today. So to give him an incentive, I took him upstairs um, and to the trophy cabinet and there's this big trophy which is the player of the tournament. And uh, I said, Jack, would you like to take that trophy home? I think it, the trophy was bigger than him. And he said, yes, Roy. I said, well, look, you have a good game today and you can take that um, trophy home with you. Would you like that? Oh, yes, he said. Anyway, we got out. I'm sitting at the back of the stand and uh, watching the game. And as the game kicks off, Jack is playing in midfield. Um, the opposition played the ball out to the left wing and Jack started running towards the ball. And he gets faster and faster as running. I'm saying, slow down, Jack. And he dived into a tackle with two feet. He hit the ball and the player over into the stand, into the crowd. The referee comes running over. He reaches for his pocket, his card. Oh, no, he's going to get the yellow card. He comes out with a red card. And he sent him off in after 15 seconds. 15 seconds? Yes, and uh, that was Jack's finished the um, tournament. Obviously, he yeah. didn't go home with the tournament. <laughs> and he went into the change rooms crying. But what I'm saying is that shows the competitive nature of Jack Wilshire, even from the age of 12. And he's still got that now. And I feel gutted that he's had so many injuries over the years. But hopefully, he can resurrect his career now as a Bournemouth. A lot of them injuries, would you say, down to that enthusiasm and that, like you say, almost like the Gaza moment in the uh, World Cup 1975, that over-enthusiasm? Yeah, it's great enthusiasm for the game. And, and, and Jack would, he even, when I knew him, even when he was a professional and doing really, really well, he would come down to Hayland and he would play a five-a-side game as passionately as he would play in front of 60,000 people at the Emirates. It is, as, you, as, you, as his coach, is, is what you want, isn't it? You want, if every player had that enthusiasm. Yes, and I, I do think most players, youngsters, do have the enthusiasm. Mm. Um, sometimes when it gets too hard for them, as they go, go through the system and they get to 18, 19 and 20, and perhaps they realise they're not going to quite make the grade at that level, then maybe their enthusiasm dims slightly. Mm. Like I said, I think it's a sign as well, especially that the players that do keep it through their whole career. Andy Murray's example of how competitive he is. And apparently it's like that in every walk of life. If he's playing snap with his brother, he, he's, he's, well, apparently his brother said he'd, he'd cry if they lost, he lost a little game like that as a kid. And mm. he hasn't lost that. No, but you, you've end. got, oh, look, if you're a professional sportsman, then you've got to have got that to, competitive yeah. edge. And you've got to want to be the best mm. and don't settle for second best. It seems to be talking about there. The, I mean, in your job, obviously, spotting talent is a huge aspect. Do you have any secrets spotting talents? Because obviously, whoever's the best under 12 player isn't necessarily going to be the best adult player, whether it's football, tennis, anything. And it seems to be the million pound question. How can you spot who's going to... Well, Leon, in my experience, if I had a crystal ball, then I would be I would have been wonderful at my job. There's no um, given formula for any 12-year-old to become a top player by the time he's 20 years of age, and I've seen that over so many years. Um, I had uh, a little lad was signed at eight years of age, and when he was a centre forward, when he was 12. He was. He couldn't run. He wasn't very athletic. He was a good footballer, but I had to sit down and tell him and his mum and dad that he wasn't quite going to make it at Arsenal Football Club. And that player was Harry Kane. Was so, Harry Kane. Uh, yeah, and Harry Kane went on uh, as, and he's got a wonderful career and he's done brilliant. Uh, but I couldn't see his there talent. There were hundreds of stories like that as well, aren't there? Well, the thing is. Um, no other club signed Harry when he was 12 in my defence no other club signed Harry when he was 12 he went into Sunday football and this is great credit to him his desire to still want to be a footballer mm. his enthusiasm was just as great I would imagine playing for his Sunday club 
than turning out playing Arsenal under 14s against West Ham under 14s. And as a result, he's come on and he's had a great career. And um, I'm very, very pleased for him. I, I did um, see one game when I was watching TV. Um, and he was playing for Tottenham against Arsenal. And it was uh, last season. And he'd already scored one goal. And it was 2-2 two -two with about a minute to go. And he climbed up at the far post and he headed the ball in to win 3-2. Obviously he was delighted and he ran to the touchline and he pulled up his shirt and he said, that's for you Roy. Did it? I I was, I was thought, wow, no, he's not having a go at me, surely. Uh, he probably doesn't remember me anyway. But then I suddenly thought, Roy Hodgson was in the stand, so it was probably for <laughs> Roy in order to uh, get him selected for the England team. Wow, what a story. But, the thing is, I don't suppose you ever forget the person who releases you, who says you're not going to be good enough. So sometimes players then accept that and don't come back. But to me, I always said, look, it's a great incentive for you to prove me wrong. Exactly. He may have used that as... Well, I, I, I'm, may, sure, I, may... I'm sure some people do. Thank but you for that almost. I do. I don't know about that, but... I do remember um, about 15 years ago, my cousin, um, Pat, was telling me the story. She went over to Cambridge to a dinner party with her husband and there was another three couples there around the dinner party. Now she lives in Upminster, it's a fair journey Cambridge. And she was sat next to this guy and um, they started talking and asking each other's names and she said, oh, my name's Pat Massey and uh, he looked, he said, um, are you related to Roy Massey? She said, oh yes, thinking he was going to speak really highly of me. And uh, he suddenly said, um, he ruined my life. She said, well, what do you mean he you ruined your life? He said, I went for a trial at Colchester United once and he pulled me in the office and said, you'll never make a footballer, son. Uh, I should look for another job. He said, he sport my dreams, he ruined my dreams. So we don't know how we really, it's very important that we respond in the right way to people, um, particularly these days when youngsters have got such uh, high hopes and we give them high hopes to become pro footballers and yet not many of them are going to make the grade. I think the percentage is, is tiny, isn't it, who will, who will make the grade? Yes, I, I think he, he probably said that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it was... He hadn't forgotten me, the one person who said he wasn't quite going to be uh, a footballer. So that must be one of your, the toughest parts of your job, sitting that player down with the parents. It was always them. the hardest part. I dreaded every at the end of every season the thought of sitting down with parents and uh, boys and saying that their time had come as far as Arsenal were concerned. And I think you know everybody in my position at any professional club would think of the same, be on the same lines. But I think it's important, and I did realise this in the early days, that you have to make sure that you don't give parents and boys false hopes. Oh, no. And if you give a good half-term half report, then you're not going to release that lad at the end of the season. There's got to be mm. pointers in the half-term report to say, look, he's got to really work on this if he's to continue, continue with the academy. Okay, so that's such a tough job, probably very often a very enjoyable job. I spoke to you before, there's a very good book that goes into this in quite a bit of detail, The Goldmine Effect. I spoke to you on the phone about yeah. it before. Yeah. Did you ever get that book? No, I haven't got it yet. Come prepared today, it's a little, a little gift for you there. I think you'll really enjoy oh, that. Oh, I'll to reading that. Very good. Crank the Secrets of High Performance. Very good. Because mm. about the, the, the Brazilian Ronaldo, he was as a teenager couldn't find, couldn't give his services away as a player, and then a couple of years later, he's he's one of the best players in the world. So it's there's some great stories in there that probably you'll uh, great. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure, that, but as I said, you know, there, there's not one answer to a lad like Harry Kane is a perfect example. But I've got a number of other uh, a kit lads who um, 
perhaps we didn't recognise their talent at an early age and they've come on and done very well. Um, there's a young lad, one of the best nine-year-olds when I first went to Arsenal in 1998 and that's when academies first started and we started running under nine side and um, we got a little lad called Dwight Gale playing for us and Dwight was a wonderful talent and for four years he played eight a side football and scored goals for fun and he dribbled past people and then when he got to 12 and 13, 14 he was playing 11 a side on the bigger pitch still tiny and couldn't get by the pitch and stopped scoring goals so his heart went out to the game wasn't so successful and eventually Arsenal let him go 14. Three years later my colleague Steve Leonard and myself we saw him in Sainsbury's just near Hale End training ground at the Arsenal. I said there's Dwight over there we went to him and said hello Dwight how are you getting on all right still playing football he said no Roy he said uh, I packed in he said I'm doing a plumbing course at the college and we felt ever so sorry for him and there again we took him about the lad being a child star and I'm sure there's lots of child stars in the game and uh, perhaps can't cope with it when it comes to the senior football uh, and then we learn later that a few months later he starts playing for Stansted and then he goes to Bishop Stalford then he goes to Dagner and Redbridge then he goes on loan to Peterborough from Peterborough he sold for £6 million to Crystal Palace and now he's gone £10 million to, mid, to Newcastle and he's having a wonderful career. So who knows what the future Brilliant. is. The most important thing when a lad is told he's not going to be good enough, you keep plugging away you and keep, keep working at it. I again. guess Harry Kane, Jamie Vardy are perfect examples. Jamie of Vardy just, must be a perfect keep, example. You keep putting the effort in, keep putting the hours in and keep that passion and enthusiasm. You can eventually get there. Yeah. I guess it's not a race. Like I said, talking about sort of superstar the kids that are superstars, I think it's quite often that often the, the very best at the young age, they're the ones that often don't make it to the top. Well, in, in many it's cases, the young, the young this, I, I think this is a... Then they get a bit too... Their, their hopes apart, they can create a bit more of a fixed mindset where it's all about success, 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 and they lose, I think you mentioned earlier, don't quite enjoy it as much, and mm -hmm. if you're not enjoying it as much, and... You lose a bit of that enthusiasm and then... I think the, tr the trouble is with the youngsters, you see, um, football can come very easy to a naturally gifted youngster. And um, he, he's born with certain football intelligence and skills. And, and it's amazing how academies now are starting looking at and developing six-year-olds. And you can see qualities of a six or seven year old you wouldn't think you could but uh, yeah. you can see the lads who are naturally gifted mm. um, and when they sign for the big clubs like the Arsenal's uh, then and they are the best players at Arsenal then the parents and sometimes the boys can be forgiven for thinking that they're the ones that's going to go through yeah. and become players and in my experience then um, it's not necessarily the very best players mm. that come through because they found it too easy. Um, yeah. Whereas the lad who's in the middle of the pecking order, he's always striving to be the best. So he's got that in his armory all the way through his career. And a perfect example is a lad called Alex Awobi, who's now in the yeah. first team at Arsenal. Yeah. And Alex, he got great talent, but I would say he would have been in the middle of the pecking order of the team he played in because there's a lot of good players. But he's come through because of his attitude, his desire, his determination and of course his ability and it's wonderful to see him performing in the first team. There's another great book called Mindset by Cal Dr Carol Dweck who says that when you're told how great you are and, and you perceive success as, as in the moment it, it kind of develops a fixed mindset with those that are told it's about the progress, learning from your mistakes, they develop a growth mindset and well, I think so there. That's that could possibly be the most important thing in, in how far a player goes, that mindset, whether they've got a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. If you want to go to the very top, you, you need that, that growth mindset. And that's the trouble with some of the, the superstar kids. They're told they're so great that it's just develops that fixed mindset. And like I say, they take it easy and then they shy away from challenges. The, the best players embrace challenges and they, and they, they love the challenges. Yes, I think, uh, as I said, you know, the lads who have it 
is is certainly at um, a club like Arsenal uh, or any club at the top level when they're playing the majority of teams in the London area then they've got the best players and so Arsenal having the best players when they're 9, 10, 11 and 12 they're going to have most of the ball yeah. and therefore they'll show their skills on the ball but probably what they won't have to do is show the skills off the ball so that when the opposition win the ball they probably give it back too easily and Arsenal have got possession again so then the players at Arsenal and the Chelsea's I would suspect have so much of the ball they don't get into the habit of having to chase back and work hard when the opposition have got the ball so that's probably I would imagine coaches are addressing that situation now. Talking of best players, who is the best player you shared the pitch with or have coached or was on the opposition, either as a player or as a coach? Does anyone spring to mind? Well, the, be the best player, I didn't play on the same pitch with him, but I was substitute and I'm going back um, to my Rotherham United days when uh, we had um, a, a, an FA Cup run where we played Nuneaton in the first round and uh, we drew non-league club and we managed a, a draw at Nuneaton and it was a tough game and we brought them back to Millmore, Rotherham and again we struggled with a 1-0 win and the crowd had a go at us because we were making a real meal of beating a non-league club and we were in the equivalent to the championship in those days in the second division. And of course we drew Manchester United in the next round. So unfortunately the manager made me sub for that game but I was still delighted to be on the bench and uh, <coughs> see the likes of George Best, Bobby Charlton, yeah, really. Dennis Law running out onto the pitch to play against the Meadows of Rotherham United. And the roar at Old Trafford was unbelievable. It was a wonderful experience to see these players. Anyway, we got a 1-1 draw and um, we took them back to Millmore. Again, I'm the substitute. And um, our changing rooms were next to each other. There's only the toilet separating the two changing rooms. And obviously we were concerned about George Best because he could beat anybody at any time he wanted. And um, it's quarter past seven and I've gone to the loo and uh, all changed, ready to go. And I saw George Best in his leather jacket and his tie and his trousers and he was talking to somebody, it might have been a reporter, at the door to the first team dressing room of uh, Manchester United. So I've come back excitedly saying, hey George Best, he's not, not playing, he must be injured. He's quarter past, we're just ready to go out and he hadn't even changed. And so we ran out and we're kicking the ball about in the goal mouth and whatever, we're getting a warm up. And then there's a big roar, Manchester United come running out and George Best is running out, 10 yards behind everybody else, tucking his shirt in his shorts. So he wasn't even in the team talk and I didn't read that Matt Busby didn't even include him in team talks because he'd say, George, go and play. And yeah. that was it. And he just left George to his own devices. Unbelievable footballer. Unbelievable, isn't he? Who, who, who do you say is the best player in the world today? Well, I think you've got to, on, on their performances, Ronaldo and Messi, Messi, I don't think I couldn't choose between them. No. Any, manager, any the manager, if there's any manager um, wanting, he could have, if Arsene Wenger, I suppose, or any top manager at his pick, I think he would be debating whether to have Ronaldo or Messi. They couldn't decide. They'd probably toss up a coin and decide. And how do you think they fare with the, the best players of all time? Well, I think the game today is it's changed so much. So I'm talking about George Best and Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton. You know, they were wonderful, wonderful players at their time. Pelly, obviously, for me, mm. has got to be the best. He was in my era. And when I saw him playing in the 1970 World Cup, and I think the Brazil team that won the 1970 World Cup were the best team best ever. Team ever seen. And, 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 but because that was my era, and that's mm. why I'm saying that they were the best. And Pelly was easily the best player ever, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Fantastic. What do you make of the modern game and the, and the changes over the years? I mean, obviously, well, you've been in the game it, a long it, time. It has changed dramatically uh, from my day. Um, I mean, I think the money 
obviously it's unbelievable what players are it's crazy, uh, isn't it? paid these days um, and um, I, I do think obviously the Premier League is fantastic and um, it's, it's worldwide. The best league in the world. It's, a, it's easily the best league in the world, and you're getting world class players. So supporters can watch the top players in the world playing every Saturday. Um, but what I would say, though, the the only difficulty then now is, which I've always been into youth development. So I like to see a youngster get yeah. his chance, yes. and um, youngsters don't get their chances today. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say necessarily it's because all these foreign players are coming in that's part and parcel but to me the one thing that stopped a youngster getting his chance today is something that has been absolutely fantastic for professional football and that's the playoffs now the playoffs are great i mean it's the most exciting thing in football but in my day when there weren't playoffs it was two up and two down so by february with about two or three months to go, there'd be a bulk of 12 to 14 teams that weren't going to get promotion and weren't going to get relegated. And the manager was safe in his job because he's not going to get relegated. So he'll say to this 18-year-old who's been scoring goals for the youth team or the reserves, I'm going to give you a run of six games. I'm not just going to give you one game. I'm going to give you six games and let's see how you get on. And then when a lad does perform and performs well, then he's going to be a player mm. um, in the manager's first team for the following season. So boys in that situation would get a chance. Today's manager can't afford to experiment with a youngster and give him an opportunity. And what an interesting point I never really thought of that. Yeah, I guess now with I think about four teams being relegated. Well, every manager... And then the next four playoffs... Every team's got something to play for, haven't they? Every Pretty manager, much, virtually to the last till May... Are under pressure, and the pressure in why, well, yeah. whether they're going to get promotion or get in the playoffs or whether they're going to be relegated. Especially how the, the turnover of managers in today's game. There's no, there's no leeway, is there? No, I mean managers didn't get the sack in the in the sixties and seventies like they do today yeah. because the most directors were happy for like Rotherham United to be in the old second division and they were uh, something like 25 years in the old second division they were the longest serving club in the old really? second division so the managers didn't get the sack so much really? because the club was happy to be in the second division they'd like to have got in the first division but as long as they weren't relegated then uh, everybody was happy i guess now that the game's such a big money in this industry isn't it like Sport has almost become an ent entertainment industry, isn't it? And, and, and it is an entertainment. Yeah, it is. Entertainment, Mon yes. And money uh, and you need well, to tickle I, the boxes. I, I do think that if you're going to be a professional footballer, then you've got to be an extrovert. Because I say, I used to say to players, look, if you are, if people are coming to pay to watch you play, then you've got to entertain them, mm. and. Um, that is the most important aspect of the game. Not so much winning, just winning. I know that supporters like to see a winning team and maybe some perform supporters would prefer their teams to be rubbish and not play very well but sneak a lucky one yeah. and win. But I think in the main, supporters are not silly and they want to see attractive attacking football. Yes, but the, 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 how much tickets are these days and and how much you've got to pay for Sky Sports and BB Sports watch the games. If you're paying a lot of money you you want to be entertained yeah, and get so three points out of you, don't you? And, and, and to see the win as well. Yeah. So again I guess it's pressure on the players and especially on the managers, especially when I was talking about the, the turnover rates of, of managers. Talking of managers, the big news lately's been obviously Sam Allardyke. What was your take on, on that whole story? Well, I feel gutted for Sam Allardyce, really. Um, you know, he's, um, he's wanted the England job and uh, he's had a fantastic reputation as being a, a manager to get the best out of players and to get the best out of average players and it would have been great to see him have a chance to work with top players. But um, 
Not to be, do you understand that? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I was glad. Um, so, my thoughts are with, with Sam Allardyce, and um, he was led down the garden path, and um, it was a shame. It's just a shame, but uh, I can't say any more than that, really. Is there much of that going on? I mean, there's sort of a debate with uh whether he's been greedy or whether he was just kind of led down the garden path. And then I think there's the other managers that have been sort of caught well, with the I think, I think any, any area where there's an awful lot of money, there's got to be, to be a certain that. amount of people looking after themselves and uh, making sure they're financially secure for the rest of their lives if they can possibly do that. Yeah. So uh, it's a temptation and some people will be tempted and some people won't. Yeah. But I've never heard of anything like no. that. Not at my level. <laughs> I'm only working with schoolboys. Yeah. Who, who would you choose to be the next England manager? I wonder if you gave Southgate take over the next four oh, matches. I think a lot of people have said Arsene Wenger. And, Arsene Wenger uh, yeah. he, if he wanted it, I he think kind of he said the other day, didn't he? Yeah, he hinted he that he may be interested. If he didn't have a job, in. then he would consider it. And his contract he, runs out at the end of, end of this, this season, I believe. It would be... A big range, 20 years, and, you know, he's, he's done wonders at Arsenal mm -hmm. Football Club. And I do think that if Arsenal win the league this year, or, and he thinks he's going to go to get another couple of years out of this particular team, then he may be tempted to stay at Arsenal um, mm -hmm. because he's got a young side and maybe they could be at the top for the next two or three years. So would he want to really give that up and hand the reins to somebody else? Probably not, but if Arsenal don't have a good season, then he might be tempted to go to England. You know, you know, you know Arsenal a lot better than most. Do you think there might be a temptation if he did win the league to think, oh, I've been building up to this, I've been building up young players, I'm going to go out on the top rather than... Well, that's something you might want to think about and have something new, I suppose, if he turns the England down in the next year, then he won't come again. So, you know, this is his opportunity, but who knows? What 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 what's Roy Massey do today then? What you, what, 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 you, well, you I retired with uh, Liam Brady um, when uh, a new regime came over, and, um, and you know it's in good hands now. The youth policy, um, they've changed the facilities at uh, Hale End. Fantastic facilities they've got, and um, they make me feel very welcome to go over and I yeah. do watch the youngsters. So I like to keep in touch. Yeah with um, the Arsenal youngsters and parents who I've known over the years and the staff and um, I'm now doing a little bit of work for Everton where yeah. I do some scouting on Saturdays and Sundays for them sometimes yeah. in midweek and it's great for me to meet old colleagues on the yeah. touchline so uh, it's nice to uh, put my feet up to a certain extent because it was full on working for Arsenal every day and loved every minute of it morning, noon and night my wife never seen me, but uh, now she sees a bit more of me. But yeah. um, I'm still involved, and um, at the at the amount that I want to be involved in, yeah. which is great for me. And I heard maybe writing a book about the, the well, I would call it a booklet, really. <laughs> um, but I, I I've really enjoyed sitting down, putting to pen to paper, and um, writing uh, a few stories about. Uh, my life in football, which uh, I spent 50 years to be fair, so I do really count myself ever so lucky to be involved in sport that uh, has been your hobby, and um, I've really loved every minute of it. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm sure if you do finish that book, I'm sure it'll be full of amazing stories. So thank you for your time. Pleasure. Roy Messi, living legend. I don't know about a legend, but I'm still living. Yeah, I'd say legend. I can say as well. Yes. If you speak to anyone in football or anyone who knows from Colchester, they have nothing but the, the nicest things to say about you, Roy. You really, really are the nicest nice people we've ever come across. So. Thanks very much. Leon, been a pleasure to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Roy. All the best.